Welcome, Carm Capriato, the Service Aftermarkets Podcast Pioneer, with the gold standard of aftermarket business podcasts. Join me for aftermarket insights as we advance the aftermarket. And as always, know that you'll learn just one thing. Find us on your favorite podcast listening app and RemarkableResults.biz or on my YouTube channel. Hey everybody, Carm Capriato, Remarkable Results Radio. I'm at, and thank you so much to G Trulia. We're uh, honored to be here. I think this is maybe our fifth year and it's the 21st annual TST Big Event. And uh, a hell of a turnout here, Tom. Yes, very much so. I just uh, just heard Bernie Thompson up on the stage. Man, what a... <laughs> what a character. <laughs> what a character. And somebody came in and said, to me, Bernie tells you how molecules work. <laughs> well, I guess as a, a technician, you need to know that. Well, when, you know, I just talking to him about that. And whenever I taught five gas exhaust emissions analysis, I did the same thing. Yeah. It was always started on a molecular level. Yeah. Because if you don't understand that, you can't understand the end result. You're hearing the voice of Tom Petty from <laughs> Petty Motor Works. <laughs> In uh, Waretown, New Jersey. That's correct. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on, Carmen. I oh, really appreciate it. Glad to have you. We, uh, it, it always happens. We, we go to events. We bring in our guest or our panel to uh, the studio, and we start talking, and we've already done the episode. And I had to say, Tom, we, time out. This is all too good. we got to capture this stuff on tape. He's a Napa Gold, and I don't know if anyone is aware of that, but Napa's got this really high-level – uh, status of being an uh, Napa Auto Care Gold, and you got to go through an awful lot. So, congrats uh, to get uh, earning gold. Yeah, I, we were one of the first ones. I, we were the first one in New Jersey, and I still think we're only one of a few. I think there's only two or three. Well, good for you. There's so much to talk about here. I, I but I love to, to kind of set up the fact that you worked as a technician in a Napa Auto Care. So, take us back a few years. And because your progression is so neat, because wait till everyone hears that he left the Napa Auto Care Independent to go to work for a dealership. I, I got to hear, we came understand full that. circle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was, you know, paying for my way to go through college. I, I, I was in an engineering technology program at a local community college, uh, which is studying electrical engineering. Uh, and that was my passion at the time. And I was pumping gas and, you know, paying for my college in 1982. And my boss says to me, well, you're the electronics guy. Here, figure this out in 1983 or so. And I did. And it understood there was a level of, hey, I know electrical really well. It's been a hobby of mine forever. You know, I, I was the kid that had that uh, Radio Shack Project kit box and Heath kit stuff, you yes, know? Yes, Heath you know? kits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look that up on Google. Right. I worked for that shop in Spring Lake, New Jersey for uh, seven or eight years. And I started technical training in the process. I was in my mid, you know, mid twenties. And I got a, a proposition from a local Ford dealership because they actually came to one of my classes and they made me an offer that I, I couldn't refuse. And I worked at a Ford dealership in Southern Ocean County for 26 years. What were you teaching? I was teaching at a local vocational level. It was at the, I was. What was the course that they watched you and said we need you? So I, it was a class titled "Domestic Fuel Injection." Okay, right. And I titled it myself, and I had very little support from Ocean County Vocational at the time because evening school training was. Here's a clipboard. Here's your roster. Give me a name for the class. And I built a 40 hour class, the first class I ever did. Wow. You know, using actual cut and paste technique, you know, where you actually use the glue pen, you know, to cut something Stop out, stick it. it and photocopy it in. You fo oh, come yeah, on. Really? Yeah. And one of their service advisors and technicians came to that 40 hour class. All right. And they made me an offer like two years later, hounded me. And I, I didn't want to go work for a dealership. And I did. And it was really a good place to work. You know, I worked there for a very long time. A long time. Yeah. When I was 52 years old, my son came to me and said, I would like to do this, Dad. And how old was he at the time? He was like 14. I, so I guess it was a little bit earlier than that. Okay. You know? but, but he was a, he was a very young man. Yes. You but, still were at 52. According to today's records, 52 is the new 40, right? Yeah. Okay. He came to you as a very young man and said, I'd love to do this. But what was this? What, what did he mean by he this? He wanted to be a mechanic. Right? Okay. And I said, okay, well, listen. I've been around the block at this point in time. I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. We're going to have a family business. All right. So we started working out of our house, you know, until we built enough customers with neighbors and friends and family to eventually get strong enough to where we could find a shop to move into. And that's exactly what we did. And eight years ago, this May, all right, we moved into that shop. 
and he's now 27. So I guess it's we started probably a little bit before then out of our house. And being a technical trainer, I, I had my own training business as well. I did a lot of sublet work for shops that struggled with some of the more advanced diagnostic stuff. You know, I did that through my entire time. You know, uh, you were you were a dealership. mobile diag and didn't know it. Yes, I was. Right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I did technical training at night. I worked at the dealership all day, and yeah. I helped other the shops that would come to my technical training with difficult to fix problems. Wow. You had zero work-life balance. I didn't. I have five kids. I have three three boys and two girls. God right. bless you. My sons got into scouting, Boy Scouts. All right. right? And I stepped back from my technical training because I didn't want to miss my kids growing up. And well, I became a Boy you. Scout leader. I've been a Boy Scout leader for 25 years. Oh, man. One of my kids made Eagle Scout. So, And then I stepped away from technical training to be more family-oriented because it was just – I was gone nonstop. Okay. How do we keep our technicians engaged? Yeah, like, like when you approached me to, to talk about this, you talked about how do you set the culture for a shop? Yeah. Let me back up a little bit. When I was at the dealership, I, I identified that I was somebody who was passionate about training to begin with because I always had a thirst for knowledge. But I was frustrated because my dealership, they had close to 30 technicians at one time. And most of those people didn't want to learn, only a handful. I keep hearing that. I know. It's, it was very frustrating. Is it still, is it still common today? Yes. Because they say, oh, the dealer trained technician, the dealer trained technician. And someone was telling me the other day, just the other day, last week, they don't want to go to training. They don't want to go to training. They're forced to go to training to meet warranty standards for the dealerships. All right. In other words, they have to meet minimal warranties checklists, you know, so to speak. I was very frustrated. There was only, you know, we were a very, you know, skilled dealership. You know, don't get me wrong. Most dealerships have a two, one or two guys that are their go-to guys. You know, we probably had five or six guys that were highly skilled and engaged in training and wanted to learn stuff. But the balance, they just kind of like wanted to, you know, replace parts and do things like that. And I think that you know, ratio is still consistent today because I only left the dealership about 10 years ago. So most of the dealership guys, they go to training when they're forced to, all right, which just baffles me. It baffles me. So when I opened my own shop, I wanted to, when, whenever I hired someone, I would say, listen, my wife's a social worker. She has to have so many continuing education credits a year. And I expect the same thing from you. Our job is a hell of a lot more difficult. Oh, well, I love that. <laughs> that. I love that analogy. <laughs> right. Oh, so, that's perfect. I said, so if you're going to come work for me, don't tell me you don't want to go to training because I won't hire you. See, and that's what's missing today, isn't it? It's what's missing. I kind of blame it on both the technician and the shop owner. And here's what I mean. If I was a technician looking for a new job and I didn't ask the question, tell me about your training culture. Tell me how many hours you expect me to get. Who pays for it? And when can I go to my first class? <laughs> and if you the, came to me and said that, yeah. I'd probably hire in a spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. Right. That's my point. But if an owner can't even talk because they're talking too much and not listening enough, if they can't even talk about their commitment to career and training, That's right then they're hiring an individual who just doesn't want to get anywhere in life. That's right. And maybe possibly show up and call that a good day. That's probably most of them. And it's very, very sad. It's sad. Yes. So I have, today I have here, I have my son with me who is, has been working with me since he's tiny because he's passionate about it even when he was young. I have my lead technician who is a dealership technician I hired from a dealership. My, what was an apprentice, but he's no longer apprentice because he's been with me for four years and he is now a, a C plus to B technician. So okay. he have developed him over the time and I have two apprentice technicians, you know, and they're both still in high school. They graduate just this June. God bless you for bringing up our youth. We're not doing enough of this, even if you want to call a high school person an intern. Right. Oh, by the way, I got this wild thought. Someone picked up the phone the other day. All it happens all the time, Tom. I got an idea for an episode, Carm. Right. Got an idea. And this person said, Carm, why don't we have interns do DVIs for us? Every one of my apprentices learned. That's the first thing they learned. And I said, that's really brilliant, but do they really know what they're looking for? was my question. So the way I handle that is we have, obviously DVI is the best way because it's prompting you to look for certain things, but obviously a skilled eye is more valuable to see things, right? Every courtesy inspection, that's what we call our DVI. Mm -hmm. One of us, some more senior technicians, review it with that okay. apprentice. All right. And we point out the things that, that maybe they missed. Got it. So. And or see, oh, you made this yellow. I don't know what your if it's red, green, or yellow. So maybe you spend 
eight minutes with the intern as you groom and grow them, yes. mentoring them, apprenticing them. Learn priority of repair. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You're kind of convincing me that maybe that would be a great episode. Maybe what we need to do is to interview your guys and say, hmm, what did you learn? Why did you start? Do you think this is cool? <laughs> well, I have a, you know, one of the great stories I have is I have a young lady working for me. Her name's Raina. She came to me when she was 16, right, with her dad wanting to know if she wanted to be a welder or a mechanic. I said, they're both very good careers. You can make a lot of money. And I, and I told her that if you're a fabricator and a welder, you can have a very engaging career. But if you're just a welder, it's a lot of looking through a little glass, right? And it can be extremely boring. So I said to you, but if you're going to be a mechanic or a technician, as I prefer to say, you have to get your hands dirty. Come in and find out if you want to work. You know, before you spend any money on technical training or anything like that, because you need to know if you have that basic aptitude and want to continue with it. Yeah, I believe I've said that being an automotive mechanical specialist or technology specialist is one of the most important skilled trades we have in our entire world. You think about all the skilled trades, right? None of them evolve at a faster rate than automotive. Right. And right? none of them are as highly skilled or, or technical as the automotive field. And that's why I'm really trying. I'm on the uh, advisory board for Ocean County Vocational. Okay. Right? Good, good for you. I'm on one too. And I'm trying to convince them that the general student that they're sending to vocational is not the student that should be in that program. Our chairman said to us at our last meeting last week, our advisory committee says, so everyone, I'm thinking of getting a driver training because I want my people to get licenses so that when they graduate here, they could actually get a job and drive there and not try to figure out how the bus route works. So I want you to take that back to your college and find out how many of these young people that are coming in, qualified or not, right can actually drive to, to a job or to an internship. Right. One of the things that our, our county has, we have several charter schools in our county, Okay. right? One of which is called MATES, and I believe that's the Marine Academic you know, something program, right? And you have to qualify to go into it. It's a high school level program. Mm -hmm. It's a four-year program and you have to qualify to get in it. And they have their phys ed program. They have all their academics uh, and it specializes around the STEM, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, science and technology. And they also have a law enforcement program, which is also a charter program. Again, that, and the funny thing is, is that law enforcement program is actually in the same building as one of the automotive programs. You know, I'm trying to see if I can convince our local freeholders to, hey, why don't you create an automotive charter program? You already have the infrastructure in place, and that way you can pre-qualify someone to go into the automotive program. Because unfortunately, most, and, I, and that's, I'm sure it's not just our vocational program, but most of the kids that go through automotive vocational do not continue. It's probably less than 10%, if less than that. We're hearing some bad stats coming out of our grads. Yes. Bad stats. In fact, the, some of the stats, you probably know this, confirm or deny that when they ultimately leave a dealership or leave even an independent, they don't stay in the industry. That's correct. Because we have disenchanted them. Yes, exactly right. And But the, the educational program is not fully to blame for that, right? So, oh, no. A hundred percent agree. Yeah. Where, where they go next should shape the rest of their career. Correct. Because, you know, like my shop, we focus on training and we focus on development. Even if it means that apprentice moves on. Let's say he needs to move up uh, to a different pay scale because he deserves it. Well, I'm going to take the position of, let me see if I can find you a position. I know a lot of people. And then I'll bring in the next apprentice. Yeah. All right. Because at, uh, and I, I don't want to pick on dealerships because they're not all this way. I don't want to create a stereotype. But unfortunately, kids come out of technical programs like UTI or Penco Tech or whatever it happens to be or local vocational levels. They go into a dealership and what happens? The dealership just sees that as cheap labor. Yes, thank you for saying that because the question that has been cycling in our industry is what is a starting pay for an individual? Forget about college and debt and all that stuff, but what's the starting pay for a it's mechanical like minimum wage? Yeah, and what what is minimum today? California now says it's what crazy money. Now I start my apprentices my apprentices at minimum wage. Okay, right, but I 
it's a regularly structured pay increase from there. Exactly. And they're required to learn. Yeah. So l- looking at it from a business owner standpoint, and you know, I have a coaching service, ATI, I'm sure you're familiar yeah, with Yeah, sure. Right? Right. And, and we look for a 60% labor margin. So yeah. for any listeners that's not familiar with that, that is you take your technical staff's wage, add any loaded benefit package and taxes and all the stuff to it, right? And you need, let's say it's $10,000 a week. You need to bill out $25,000 a week in labor to cover that $10,000 Exactly. Week. Two and a half times. That's a 60% margin. Yeah. But dealers want a 70% or more. So what that means is how do you get a higher labor margin? Mm-hmm. Pay less charge more, right? So they're not allowing an opportunity for advancement. In a dealership environment, you should be taking that apprentice and marrying him to one of your high-skilled guys, yeah. right? And investing in that person's development. It's too competitive. They're focused on the labor margin as opposed to the development of the staff that they're going to need to perpetuate their business. Yeah. If you had a chance to speak at your career fair, which you recently had, and ours at our college is next week, in fact, What would you tell them that you should think about for a starting wage? Forget minimum wage, forget apprentices, forget internships. You're out of a two-year school. Here's what you, here's what you should look for. So coming out of a two-year school? Yeah. In our area, I would say at least be the high teens. Okay. The high teens. Yes. Right. You know, and depending on the structure and it, like I, one of the things I did at the dealership, what I was a shop steward as well, because we were a union shop and I was very frustrated as how they would get young technicians and hold them in a pay rate, Mm -hmm. right? So in other words, yes, they're going to label an apprentice. And at the time when I left the dealership, it was $11 an hour. Can you imagine? Right. So that's about 10 years ago. And they would hold him at that rate until the kid either complained to the point to where he got some raise or he quit. He left, he quit, right? Or moved on. And like you said, he, many times they would leave the field altogether. Right. And that's what's killing us. All right. I put into the the last contract that I did, I I guess that was around 2016, right? An appendix, right? About structured raises every six months, 50 cents. And I wrote this appendix and it, it, you know, cleared my union representative. and, And I said, and, you know, I put in there, and if the person doesn't deserve that raise, there needs to be a reason why he doesn't deserve it. And if it means he's not right for the position, you got to tell him maybe it's time to move on to pick a different vocation. But to suppress his wage growth, is it wrong? And you do that progression until he reaches, you know, your uh, agreed upon structural, you know, wage, you know, ABC stuff. Hey, it's no secret. We're facing a technician shortage and Napa Auto Care has a solution with the Napa Auto Care Apprentice Program. The program was pioneered by one of our own. Pete McNeil and Master Technician Jake Sorensen from McNeil's Auto Care in Sandy, Utah, realized that the problem of not having technicians available for hire was not going to solve itself and decided to take action and look at a different audience of individuals available for hire. A focus was put on younger individuals with the right passion, desire, and attitude to work in the automotive repair industry. Jake and Pete sought after these individuals and developed a technician apprentice program to give them the training needed to become a successful technician in today's world. The NAPA Auto Care Apprentice Program includes a comprehensive nine-stage curriculum that includes a variety of types of training, and they are classroom training videos exclusive to the apprentice program. Now, these videos provide in-depth training from a successful master technician. Also, Autotech classes with instructor-led courses offered through Napa Autotech and Autotech eLearning. This web-based eLearning is designed to target specific training topics. And finally, hands-on learning. The apprentice will apply the skills gained from the classroom training videos, Autotech instructor-led training, and Autotech eLearnings in the shop with the guidance of a mentor. The apprentice program curriculum is competency-based, meaning an apprentice can move through each stage at a pace that best suits them. Most apprentices complete the program within two years. Upon completion, apprentices will have earned ASE G1, A4, A5, and AC certifications, adding industry validation to the skills an apprentice acquires. Look, having an apprentice in your shop will ultimately benefit your bottom line as they advance through the program. And in most cases, as the apprentice develops their skill set producing billable hours, you'll begin to see a growth in your gross profit by stage five. One of the largest barriers to entry for individuals looking to enter the automotive repair industry is the cost of tools. Now, keep your apprentice motivated with an apprentice toolkit. Now, Napa Auto Care has worked with our supplying partners to offer an exclusive comprehensive tool set, including a four-drawer tool card for all registered apprentices. Hey, to learn more, members can visit member.napaautocare.com. 
Are we hurting our future technology specialists, mechanical specialists to hire when we go out as an industry and say, oh, you can earn 100K? We're saying that loosely, it seems to me, without qualification. That's correct. It takes time to get to a wage like that. And yes, you can earn 100K. My, you know, my lead technician is close to that point at this point. Yes, you can. But it takes time and experience. Right. Right. And, you know, what someone's worth is based on what they can produce for a company, obviously. But you have to have your company built right to be able to support no it. No kidding. I'm an owner and says there's no I don't I don't make that money. Why would I want to even think of paying some wait a minute. I'm taking home eighty. I can I, in order to set my ego up and my life and so that I can put my head on the pillow every night, I will never pay anybody more than Sixty thousand because I'm taking home eighty, and and I would love to sit down with that individual and say, let me show you on a piece of paper how wrong that is. <laughs> that means you're not running your business right. Yeah, I know, I know, and it's an attitude that no one has been able to overcome right. because they haven't joined a coaching group or a mentoring group That's or a correct. twenty group because they are unwilling to share their secret sauce because their secret sauce is just failure. So even before I had a business. And I was part of ATI, or I, I was at a technical training business. So I trained for Napa, I trained for parts stores, tool companies, I trained for Snap On for a while. I would have, you know, uh, shop owners come up to me. I can't find anyone, right? And I can't tell you how many times I heard that. I said, that means you're not buying the talent you need. Well, I can't afford to pay them. Well, then you're not running your business right. <laughs> if you can't afford to buy the talent you need to be in business, then your business model's flawed. I have to tell you, that's the big takeaway right now from this episode. If you're going to walk away with listen to learn just one thing, buying the talent you need. And buying means you have to have money, yes. meaning you have to have success and profit. You have to have cost control, the right margins, that's all of that stuff that generates. And a lot of people don't realize that the net operating income of a business goes to grow the company and to give new wages. Right. I mean, you pay off debt, buy new equipment. You don't do all that stuff out of the cash flow of the business. It has to be on the bottom line and it has to be there. And, and let's face it, we're in a customer service business, right? Yeah, we are. How could you possibly service your customers right if you don't have the correct staff to do that? Yeah. You're, it's, a, again, a flawed business model. Yeah, period. Yeah. Buying the talent you need. I mean, the big question is, is how do you do that? And that could be a different episode. you got to come back and, yeah. <laughs> and, and explain like all the other coaches come on and talk about. Yeah. It's a di we are in such a dynamic business. It's, it's not hobbyist type business today. It's sophisticated. We have to learn how to be better leaders, improve our culture, make sure that we're listening to our people. Lately, I've been calling it management by walking around. And way back, it was Eula Packard that created MBWA. And then Tom Peters wrote a book, In Search of Excellence, in 82, who brought that whole concept back around. And then just recently, guys talking about uh, having cameras in the shop and finding out how people were stealing from them. And I'm saying, oh, cool, interesting. Hmm, guess what? You need the cameras. I get that. But that isn't in lieu of being with your people, yes. manage by walking around. The common sense that God gave you that in the policies in your business, all you, you get a chance to see them and feel them and be with them right. if you're out there. So Carm, one of the, you, we talked about culture, yeah. right? We do two big training events a year, right? So we do Super Saturday in Pennsylvania, yeah. which I've seen you there as well, yeah. and TSD, yeah. right? We always stay over. For Super Saturday this past year, we closed down on a Friday to go to training. Nice. Right? Well, like last night, we went over to the Palisades Mall and we did go-karts at 11 o'clock at night. You know, we went to Dave and Buster's and had dinner as a group. Perfect. Yeah, because you have to bond with your group. You know, again, you have your team is the most valuable asset you have. How could you possibly offer the best customer support without a quality team? Sell tires? I do. A lot? Not many. For a small shop, we do about four or five hundred tires a year. Tell which me, isn't bad. Tell me about supply chain. Are we having any issues getting uh, parts? A lot of electronic parts. Okay, yes, electronic. Absolutely. I mean, I have a, a, a GMC vehicle on a lot right now. I've been waiting four months for a, an anti-lock brake control module. Intergalactic national back order. You know, one of those things, and we run into that quite frequently. I think after COVID, some some supply items just never recovered. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of talk about communication in our industry today. 
as being in the top three to four critical strategies and, or policies or procedures that you have to have, that 360 communication between front and back of shop and, of course, office and owner. How, how are you guys making that work well? I mean, the three most important communication items that I can attest to is the first and foremost, again, we're customer service, so the communication between the customer and ourselves. Today, if you're not using digital inspection, you're a fool. All right. I was using digital inspection when I was running my business out of my house 10 years ago. All right. And can you imagine that? I had tablets. You were a house that, guy, huh? Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> you know, that sometimes when you got a big family, you got to figure out how to make things work. Five kids. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yep. If you're not communicating through a digital inspection pro platform, you're just missing a boat. Because let's face it, when we were young, Carm, what did we do? We would get the customer into the shop and we'd do a show and tell. Yeah. This is our show and tell. By, by the way, I heard a great stat. Customers want to be communicated with 86% of the time through, you know, the answer text. Oh, okay. You agree with that? I do. Yep. It's, it's quite frankly, it's easy. You know, it's, uh, you know, of course, a text shouldn't be so complicated. It should be like a dialogue that consumes more time, but it can be uh, a form to have the customer contact us, yeah. uh, get the, the quick things through the process. Absolutely. We even do, you know, text payment processes through. So how, what are your methodologies or policies about front to back of shop communications? How are you making that work? Our shop is small. So we still do technician walks to the service advisor, service advisor okay. walks to the technician. Right. Our digital inspection platform through Auto Vitals uh, does have the ability to go totally paperless, but I haven't done that yet. Okay. I still want to have that a communication with the service advisor at the vehicle. It's, I think it's better for establishing understood priorities because if, if you're a, a small shop owner, you're focusing on customer loyalty, okay? So it's not, you know, like some shops, they don't have customer loyalty and they focus on high volume and customer turnover, right? I focus on customer loyalty. So when a car needs, let's say the brakes are three millimeters to four millimeters thick, you know, which is the time when you're starting to tell a customer, hey, you're coming up on brakes. Where some shops, they don't know if that customer is going to come back. They might sell that brake job today. Our shop is going to advise the customer that, hey, we're going to check your brakes again next visit. Yeah. All right. So that's now we're going to make that a cautionary item. So the communication with that customer is to establish priority. And I feel that when a service advisor visits the car and reviews that you know, list of items with the technician, it's better for him to communicate the priorities of the repairs. So repairs and maintenance items. What's your feel, Tom, about recommending to a new customer that you're doing the courtesy inspection to that has a yellow on brakes, never been there before? You have confident you can bring them back? Sometimes. I mean, I have a very high loyalty business. I mean, you know, when other shops are struggling with car count, we're, car car count is normally pretty stable okay. because we do honestly tell customers what they really need. Let's say that new customer comes in. We have to dialogue with that customer to let them know that brakes are subjective, right? And I use the ex example of if this was my son's, my 17 year old son's car, it might go through brakes faster than the way you're driving. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll check them again next visit. So we're not selling them brakes today, nor would we recommend it. We're telling them that this is just advisory. It means they're getting close, but it's very difficult for us to determine how much longer they're going to last because it's dependent on your driving habits. Can we tell them at the counter, listen, we do business with a ton of customers who've become loyal to us, and we look forward to you being a loyal client also. That, that's a great approach. Yes, absolutely. I would love to bring that in. Yeah. yeah. Cool. There's so much, so much to talk about. Independent groups in town. You don't have a, a lot of members in the Napa program in your area. And I get it because there are pockets of that that live in cities, but you're trying to put together an independent group. Yes. And we have one, one in Buffalo, eight years strong, 20, 25 shop owners show up once a month at an early morning breakfast and I'm just telling you, that's a really cool way. It seems to work for us. Yeah, right. Tell me what you're doing. Last year about this time, so early 2023, I was frustrated because I had just gone to a, a local training seminar put on by a local parts store that did not meet what I consider good standards, right? Not to be talk poorly of a fellow technical trainer, but sometimes they're just not as good as they should be, right? And I was frustrated with the quality of training in our area. 
you know, and having a background in technical training, I knew we could do better. There's very good talent out there. But of course, you have to buy that talent in. You know, it might be two or $3,000 to get a technical instructor in to come in. So I approached the other like-minded shops in our area, two of which are Napa stores. Others aren't, right? Two aren't, right? So there's five shops that kind of run our program, plus a local Napa store is actually helping us as well, in the parts store, Good. right? And, and, I, and I said, let's form a group. It took us a month to figure out what we should call ourselves, you know, so we call ourselves South Jersey Automotive Training Alliance, and we put on our first class. And it was a Napa-sponsored class, so it didn't cost our group anything. Uh, a local restaurant, diner in town, has a great banquet room in the back, and they charge us 25 bucks a head for a abbreviated menu. You can get a Caesar wrap or a salad or a hamburger or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they give us a room for free. Nice. So it's a good, it's a good way to balance a budget. Mm -hmm. We put 50 people in that room. The first time we had a class. Nice. And then we had Craig Van Battenberg down from Massachusetts cool. to do a you know, right. hybrid class for us too. Right. So we started running these events at, you know, a net zero. You know, in other words, we're volunteering right. our time, collecting res rosters yeah. and soliciting yeah. our group. Yeah. So we had four classes last year. And I don't think any of the classes were under 50. I think the most expensive class was when we had to get Craig down from Massachusetts. I think we, I think it was 120 bucks for a two night class. I mean, you can't. No, just stick no, you, no, no, you can't. No. And you normally the two night class, it's, you know, $150 a night. So it'd be $300. For it. Right, exactly. And if we have a surplus because we based the budget off of 40 people and 60 showed up, we, at the end of the year, we gave away $2,500 in door prizes yeah, yeah. in December when NGK came and did a class for us. So you're listening to this. Tom has just laid out some incredible thinking points, strategic ideas for you to grow and improve to stretch the camaraderie that you have with local people to commit to training to hear the story about what we're going to pay people and how we're going to train them and he's a great guy but even better even greater is your kidney donor and i want to talk about it because recently chris cotton who is on the aftermarket radio network his wife kimberly gave a kidney to her brother mm -hmm. and he did an episode he explained the the upside and he also recently did one now so many months later it hasn't published yet but it will you gave your kidney to your brother-in-law tell us the story my wife's family all right my mother-in-law was married twice her first up and past of a chronic kidney disease called iga nephropathy i think i'm saying that right and it affected all the first three children of that of that marriage so my wife is from the second marriage so when my oldest brother-in-law was going into kidney failure had already been on dialysis and for those who don't know dialysis is not easy on your body it is extremely difficult and prone to complications so even though some people go through dialysis for decades right we all got tested and just coincidentally i kind of matched better than anyone else Right. So, you know, I went up to the hospital in Livingston. All right. I, seemed, I believe it was the same Barnabas. Talked to the people there, including social workers and surgeons and the people that ran the program. Uh, like, yeah, I can do this. You know, and that was in 2001. All right. So that's a long time ago. It's 20, 22 years, three yeah. years ago. Wow. And since then, all right, unfortunately, my, my family, that, that, that disease has required other kidneys. Right. So there is five living kidney donors in my family, which is kind of unheard of. Donors or recipients? Donors. Donors. Yes. Wow. So my wife and myself and two of my sister-in-laws, right, gave to their brothers, right, because the disease, IgA nephropathy, is, can damage even a donor kidney. Your wife gave up too? Yes. Wow. And my sister-in-law, having an odd blood type, felt that she she was the, the, the wife of my brother-in-law that I gave to, felt compelled to be an altruistic donor. So she gave without anything. You know? wow. So I gave to a family member, right? but an altruistic donor gives to some stranger. What's her strange blood type? Do you remember? I, I believe it was AB or something like that. Okay. You know? So it's like I'm O, which is a universal yeah. type. Of I scenario. have a very, very rare. I want to hear more on the kidney, but I'll never forget being in the Army in basic training. They said, anyone who donates blood today can have the day off. And I raised my hand right away. I go into the uh, donor facility and they type me. Oh, I'm sorry. It was on my dog tag. It was already there. Right. So the guy grabs the dog tag and he says, you come with me. And I didn't know quite why. And I'm on there and he's hooking me up and he goes, I'm going to take extra special care of you. You're going to get some extra treats at the end. And I says, what's the big deal? He says, you have one of the rarest blood types 
was it? AB negative or something? AB like negative. Yeah. yeah. And he says, and that's me. So I have to take extra special care. We don't get a lot of you in here. <laughs> so, so my sister was AB negative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. AB negative. Yeah. I find it fascinating to 20 some years ago, you're, you still have one kidney. Yep. What was your life post surgery and how is it today? Do you even know or miss it? As we were sitting in the, the training class, the only thing I noticed about having one kidney is only one part of my back hurt when I really had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other than that, very, very nothing else. Y yes, you have limitations. You can't take certain NSAIDs like Advil and ibuprofen because they are very difficult on the kidneys. And any, everybody should know this, quite frankly. So if you're out in your backyard in the summertime and sweating like a fiend and your back hurts, do not take Advil. It's really bad for you. Don't take Advil. And I don't mean to talk badly about no, Advil. That, that's a, no, any, that's okay. Any NSAID. I t you know what works on me? Aleve. Is yes. that like an Advil? That's or? an NSAID, yes. Oh, that is? Yes. Okay. And those types of medications, I believe it's like a 1 in 10,000 spontaneous kidney failure. Actually, one of our customers, he, he was in construction, had a sore back, and it was summertime, and he wasn't hydrated enough, and he was popping Advil like chiclets. And uh, he killed both of his kidneys. Oh, jeez. No, go to Tylenol. It doesn't work as well on you know joint pain, but you know it's it's better for you. Well, thank you for that. Um, so the recovery period. I mean, let, tell me about the six months after. So the way the doctors at St. Barnabas told me is that your kidney is one of the few organs that will adjust itself to your needs. In, in a very short period of time, it was probably six weeks or so. In that period of time, I felt lethargic and just not right, right? But within that six weeks, you know, you're back to normal. Your kidney doubles in size and it does the function of two. Really? Yeah. So listen, I'm not a doctor. That's my understanding. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. I, I, well, and beyond that, I didn't have any other complications our, whatsoever. Our body is such a miracle. When, when I heard Chris, I, I can't remember if he talked about it in his episode or he told me on the side, or where did I learn this? That they don't take out the bad kidney. They just put the other kidney That's in. Right. That's right. It goes in the lower abdomen. Yeah, yes, it goes in the lower abdomen. Uh, so my, I, I my found brother in law. Fascinating. I, so he had my kidney, my wife's kidney, an altruistic donor. He has five kidneys in him, three donated kidneys, and two of his original kidneys. Now, his original kidneys are about the size of a walnut at this point because they've just you know shrunk up to nothing. But you know, I think he has five kidneys in there. It took that many? Yes, unfortunately. Wow. I know you've turned into here all this great automotive service <laughs> business acumen, but when we have a chance to tell a story like this, because life goes on in our bays, in our world. That's right. And there's nothing more important than family. Wow. Anyway, so. It sure is. Thank you so much for this. I know you and I could probably talk for two or three hours and just I'm go sure. from rabbit hole to rabbit hole, but I got to have you come back on. This was Really great. Tom Petty, man. Carm, thanks for having me. Petty Motor Works out of Waretown, New Jersey, Napa Gold. And congrats on that. That's not easy to get. No, it's not. Thank you, man. All right. Thank you.